Now we have Ryan Lynch from McGill University. Hi. I don't think we can hear you, uh, so you need to uh, unmute yourself uh, up better? at the top right. Oh, I, he I hear you now. OK. It said that I was muted by default, and I wasn't sure if that meant you didn't yes. want me to talk. If there's more than three people in the Hangout, it starts muting people as soon as they come in. So <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug, oddly okay, enough. So it's not just me, then. So uh, Ryan and I also go back to, so we've had a string of UVA alum uh, starting with Phil Plate and going through the whole Hangout. Um, so we need uh, his slides up for screen share. Uh, I'm working on okay. it. OK, <laughs> he just popped out. Um, so uh, Ryan Lynch, uh, first of all, I want to say give a shout out to Genevieve de Messier, who's also watching. Uh, she works at the Smithsonian, and I know they were hoping for clear skies to use their solar telescope today. So hi, Genevieve. And she has the most amazing name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Ryan, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and and uh, what you're working on while uh, Pamela queues up the slides? Oh, here they are. Okay, great. Um, so, like you said, I was in grad school with you at UVA, um, where we had lots of fun times, and I got involved in a lot of uh, astronomy outreach projects there. Mm -hmm. Right now, we had I'm a DSPK a segment at 3 a.m., so <laughs> <laughs> they got to see that. Yeah, yep. DSPK was one of the big ones. Um, right now, I'm a postdoc in McGill University. Uh, I'm up in Montreal, so hello from Canada, and. I split my time between doing research in, in pulsar astronomy and doing a bunch of different outreach projects. And the one I was going to talk about today, actually sort of a fusion of the research that I do and the uh, outreach that I'm interested in, it's a project called NanoGrav, which uh, well, I can tell you a little bit more about it, but it uses pulsars to try and detect these really cool things called gravitational waves. Of course, uh, Pamela abandoned me with the trackpad that doesn't work for me, um, so I don't know how to go through the slides on this thing. So <laughs> we're. I heard uh, about zero percent of what you just said there. Sorry, um, Pamela <laughs> abandoned me uh, with the slides not working on her computer. So even though they're up, uh, I can't get them to work. <laughs> um, so uh, just give me a second. She. Uh, left me with a trackpad that doesn't work for me. So uh, we don't have slides, even though they're up on the computer. So is that OK? Yeah, that's OK. OK. I can improvise. Sounds good. So let me just tell you a little bit about what Nanograv is um, to start off with. So first of all, the name Nanograv stands for North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, um, which is sort of loaded. Ah, I see slides moving on. It sort of works. Your screen now, it looks like. There okay. we go. So that's, that's, that's perfect. I can embiggen. Uh, so Nanograv is actually it's a pretty big collaboration um, with members across the United States and Canada. So that's the North American part of the name. And then you can see on the slide there, there's some pictures. We're sort of concentrated mostly on the East Coast. Um, but we also have some people on the West Coast and down in Texas. And so this is, this is definitely a national sort of collaboration, international collaboration. Um, and if you want to move to the next slide, there's a nice picture of us, um, sort of a large number of people who are in the group. That's, yeah, that's so one of the things I a lot about is, is the people doing the science and outreach. So this is a great group you have here. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is really cool about this project is that there's a lot of student and postdoc involvement going from undergraduates and even some high school students who are sort of involved in some aspects of the project, um, all the way up through people like me and senior researchers. So this is a nice picture of a large portion of the group that was taken at the Arecibo Observatory down in Puerto Rico. So some people might recognize, you mm -hmm. can't see the dish of the telescope, we're actually standing sort of above it um, because it's 300 meters in diameter. But you can see that massive um, set of scaffolding and the receiver dome. Um, which looks kind of small in that picture, but is actually really, really big. Um, you know, if you were to put a person out there, they would look, you know, tiny. Um, you know, that 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 whole thing is about 150, 200 meters away from us, so it, it's really rather large. So we get to use some really cool telescopes like that. Um, 
And just to sort of tell everyone what gravitational waves themselves are, if you just want to move to the next slide, I just have a nice little picture here. So we're really yep. interested in trying to detect these, these gravitational waves. These are something that's been predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. We often describe them as ripples in space-time. Um, we have good indirect evidence for believing that they exist, but we've never actually directly detected them. And so the whole goal of this nanograph project is to do just that, to directly detect these gravitational waves, and then to use them to study things in the universe that we would have no other way of really being able to study, like supermassive black holes um, at the centers of galaxies and looking at what happens right in the first few moments before they uh, are about to merge with each other, or maybe not the first few moments, but you know, sort of tracking that um, throughout that whole merger process, along with some other really cool science. And then, if you want to move to the next slide, I just have a few more. Down, down, down. The way I got into this um, is that I study pulsars. And Are you pulsars, one of those pulsar guys? There's a whole I'm one group of, those of you. one of pulsar guys. We're, the, we're, we're sort of the, the cool kids on the block, I think. Um, but, of course, the cool kids on the block probably don't say that. So, <laughs> maybe I just gave myself away. <laughs> Um, so a pulsar is this basically dead, it's a dead star. It's only about the size of a large city, which is actually really small for a star, but it has as much mass as 500,000 Earths. Um, so it's super, super dense. And another way of thinking about that is taking the entire population of the planet Earth and squeezing that, all of us, all the human beings down into the size of a sugar cube. Ew. Um, <laughs> that is the density of pulsar material. It's, well, I mean, okay, so it sounds kind of gross, but I think at that point you cease to be a living human being. So you yeah, have, you're way you beyond dead body. at that point. Yeah, <laughs> so you're getting a little friendly with your neighbor. Um, you're beyond dead, but at least you're not spaghettified. I don't know how I feel. I'd rather be spaghettified, but... <laughs> <laughs> you may, may rather be spaghettified. Depends on who your roommates are, I guess. That's true. That's true. In, in your cube. So these pulsars are kind of like interstellar lighthouses, and each time this beam from a pulsar points at the Earth, we can detect it using radio telescopes. And they rotate very precisely, so we can use them like clocks. And the way that we're really trying to detect pulsars, or detect gravitational waves by using pulsars, is by looking for tiny little changes in the rate at which these clocks tick. Um, and it's almost like a global positioning system in some sense, only we're using it on interstellar scales to really try and detect the slight changes in the position of the Earth due to these gravitational waves that pass by. Um, and it's really cool science, and it's something that is really on the cutting edge. Um, like I said, no one has directly detected gravitational waves before. There are several different experiments using different methods that are sort of in a race to do this, and, and nanograv and this idea of what we call pulsar timing array, I think is one of the most exciting ones. And nanograv is just one project, actually, um, in an international or intercontinental uh, sort of collaboration we call the International Pulsar Time Array because there are teams in Europe and in Australia which are trying to do something very similar. And in fact, uh, we're having a meeting just this week and then the following week um, for this whole International Pulsar Time Array. So there's a bunch of people who are hanging out down in uh, Thailand um, right now. Unfortunately, I think it's monsoon season, so they're not enjoying the next weather. So they're wet in Thailand. Hopefully, it'll clear up and they can enjoy themselves a little bit in addition to doing some great oh, things. Oh, is that why Tucky was, was, was uh, Facebook posting from Thailand? Yes, I think she's okay. really excited to show everyone around. And yeah, it's her home country. All the, the good food. Um, give them some, some sort nice. of native nice. Thai spice. Um, if you want to go on to the next page real sure. quick. I talked a little bit about the science, but we have this whole outreach component to nanograv, which is what I really do in the project. Um, sort of educating the public and trying to spread the word about the science and excite people and inspire the next generation of scientists using this really amazing science is an integral part of what nanograv is all about. And so we have a podcast series that people can find on our website. We have a, a video series on YouTube. They're sort of like this Khan Academy style lectures. And we actually have been trying to develop a bunch of new resources over the past few months. The outreach uh, component of the nanograph is really starting to take off. So we're going to be doing a lot more within hopefully the coming year and beyond. But I wanted to highlight a few things for people who are watching 
um, in ways that they actually might be able to get involved, and especially if there's any uh, students watching who are interested in this sort of thing. Oh, yeah. There's some really great uh, projects. So one of them is the Einstein at Home project, and this is something that anyone anywhere in the world can do. It's sort of based on the SETI at Home mod, um, model. So you download a little computer um, program, and it runs in the background whenever your screensaver pops up, and it actually analyzes data from radio telescopes to look for pulsars. Looking for pulsars is one of the, the important things that we do in Nanograv. And so this is a way to sort of dedicate some of your computer time to help us do this and to try and find the particular types of pulsars that we're interested in called millisecond pulsars that are useful for the project. Um, two other really amazing projects that are going on in Nanograv are the Pulsar Search Collaboratory and something called the Air Cibo Remote Com Command Center. And these are projects that have a really huge student involvement. So the Pulsar Search Collaboratory uh, basically recruits high school students, primarily so far from West Virginia, Virginia, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, and, and sort of the, the southeastern states, as well as uh, the Midwest in, in Wisconsin. But we are in the process of, of trying to find funding and trying to ramp up to a basically a national, um, or at least a much broader sort of model. And we're probably going to have Pulsar Search Collaboratory teams and different nanograv institutions, and we're going to try and involve even more high school students to really get their hands on real astrophysical data that no one else in the world has access to. So you know, this is their data. It's not like the Pulsar astronomers already know what's there. You know, they're doing real cutting-edge science and helping us look for pulsars, and this has already been a really successful project. Yeah, I've met um, some of the high school students when I was working in Green Bank. Uh, they come out to the telescope and do the data analysis alongside the astronomers looking for these pulsars. And so yeah. this, is, this is one of those uh, human-based projects like what we have in CosmoQuest. We have people looking through all that data to find these pulsars that can be used in these timing projects. Yeah, it's exactly right. And the, the, the students have made a lot of discoveries so far. Um, a couple millisecond pulsars, which are the ones that we're really interested in. Some yeah. of them look like they might be really scientifically interesting. Um, the, the student who found the first astrophysical source in our data is sort of a weird type of neutron star that we call rotating radio transient. Actually got to go to the White House for a, yeah. for a star night and uh, observe with the president. Um, this was just after President Obama got elected, so um, he got to go up there for that, which is a really cool experience for a high school student to have. Um, you know, not many people get to do that. Yeah. And like I said, we're trying to ramp this program up and bring it to even more people. And the other really amazing one is the Arecibo Remote Command Center, which is based out of the University of Texas at Brownsville, as mm -hmm. well as the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And they recruit undergraduate students, as well as some high school students, to do a whole bunch of different things. So they get to, they get to help out with observing. So they're actually sitting there remotely controlling some of the world's you know most amazing telescopes, like the Arecibo Telescope and the Green Bank mm -hmm. Telescope. Um, Oops. And they're actually building a radio telescope in Texas or uh, New Mexico. Um, they're building different sites um, throughout the United States. They're looking into partnerships with SpaceX mm -hmm. to build tracking stations down in Brownsville um, for satellites. And some of those, uh, some of the time on those radio telescopes would then also be used for pulsar astronomy and a bunch of just other really amazing things. Um, and so we're, we're looking to try and partner with them more closely as well as part of Nanograv. I, th I think UT Brownsville is also involved with the Long Wavelength Array, um, yep. who we are in talking to about getting this CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project started. And I, I talked to some of the students at the January AAS about yeah. the systems that they're building to do a similar thing, transient detection. Uh, uh, they're, they're doing you know, a single automated dipole to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So they're doing a lot of work, again, getting students building things and looking at data uh, right off the bat. Yeah, that's exactly right. What I think is so amazing is that they're actually getting undergraduate students to build a telescope, and, and yes. not just like you know, sort of just a little trial telescope that you set up in your backyard, and then oh, that's nice. But you know, they're talk we're talking about you know a real, um, you know, high class telescope that's going to do you know real cutting edge sort of science. Um, not again, not many students get an opportunity to do something like that, and and yeah. to be so intimately involved with it. Um, it's it's really really wonderful. Yeah, so that's so cool. Um, so pulsars are just a fertile field for students. If you're a high school student or, or an undergrad, uh, pulsars, uh, okay, I'm biased again, radio, whatever, but pulsars yeah. are kind of, uh, they're a cool astrophysical phenomenon, and, and uh, there's a lot of, of good research to be done uh, yeah, at, at any level. Yeah, the last slide I have just has some websites for people to go to if they're interested in learning anymore. I won't go through all of them except to point out just um, 
there's a website there, info at nanograph.org. So anyone who's interested for any reason um, in learning more about the project, whether you're a teacher that's interested in having uh, an astronomer come and, and maybe try and give a talk to your school if there's someone nearby, we'd love to set that up. Um, if you're a student that's interested in getting involved with some of these projects, or maybe you're uh, uh, looking at where you want to go to college and you think you might be interested in astronomy, um, we have a lot of programs where undergraduates can get involved, and as well as just the general public. If you have questions, you know, email us and, and go to any of those web pages to learn more information. Because um, we love take to a screenshot from... now. <laughs> Perfect. If you're watching the hangout, take a screenshot. Get all those websites. <laughs> yep. And yeah. That's so cool. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, Ryan uh, Lynch is a uh, postdoc at McGill University and another uh, UVA and Dark Skies Bright Kid alum. Uh, we have spread ourselves away from Central Virginia to do astronomy outreach wherever we are. And so, uh, and uh, yeah, he, this is another great project where we're all in this in this funding fight together. Um, so uh, you know, support science, support science education, and and citizen science projects like this. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. I hope the rest of the thank hangout you. goes well. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. We've been awake for, what, 28 hours? Oh, uh, no we problem. Have three hours left, so we're over 29 at this 29 point. 29 hours? Plus, we got up two guys, hours before the hangout started, so we've been awake for 31 hours. I haven't done this since Steve Majeski's class. Awesome. <laughs> I just want to also say, that, you know, it's awesome you guys are doing this, and, and um, you know, the, the level of dedication is really, really cool to see. So best of luck to you guys. Thank you. And I'm sure I'll be seeing you on a future episode of Learning Space. Yep, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Good to see All you. All right, take care. See you. Take care. <laughs> Bye.